All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Daniel Backer, and my co-host Pringle is somewhere off screen right now, but welcome to Off the Wall Novels. And uh, joining us today is Mike Jimerson, improviser, and I recently discovered talented painter, which I meant to ask you about. But uh, yeah, how's it going, Mike? It's great. How are you doing, Danny? Long time no see, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing well. It has been a long time. Um, for those of you who don't know, Mike and I are both from Kansas City, and I guess we met in Chicago, though, through improv circles and things like that. But uh, I had actually seen you in Kansas City on your team, Not a Great Gorilla, way back in the day. Oh, boy. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, I that takes me back. All, all the way in your roots. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like we did meet there, didn't we? Because uh, I feel like our, our main, our mutual connection was Patrick, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like maybe we did meet there, but then we hung out because I remember hanging out at the Annoyance and I remember you saying that you would never try a menthol cigarette because it would prohibit you from being able to travel to space. <laughs> I don't think I've kept to that. <laughs> well, I mean, is that even is that were you correct about that? That It sounds like Internet trivia that I, I guess I latched on to at the time. Well, hey, could be right. Also, I don't because I know, you know. Uh, there's all kinds of weird myths about menthol cigarettes out there, and I've not other investigated myths about menthol cigarettes. Yeah, what's that? What are, What are the other myths about? Oh, cigarettes? oh, that's just like um, uh, they essentially crystallizing your lungs. I guess that's the main one that I know. Oh, uh, okay, and I that think, may be true. I think that's where the space thing came from. Is that it's like something about the pressure of leaving the atmosphere, but I'm actually, I'm, a, I'm too afraid to go to space anyway, I think. Oh, like, really? I just don't think I have the fortitude to like exit the atmosphere and look back and see the earth there. So yeah, I'm good anyway. Right, dude. I was, I was actually, I was just thinking about that today. Oh, I was watching some Norm McDonald clip where he talks about going to space oh, okay. and just talking about being in a lunar capsule and those guys back in the day, I mean, what a tiny, like to be in, to be in space, I think would give me such a claustrophobic feeling. I mean, that there's there's no escape, you know, and that if, if you did get out of this thing, I mean, you're dead, you know? Uh, yeah. It's just so much faith in technology, so much faith in the calculations of other people. I think uh, that would freak me out too. And a little arrogant, I think too. I think that- Right. Oh, like, it is. You don't need to go there. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but then at the same time, like there's this, there's this photo of, uh, of one of the Apollos as it's as it's leaving the Earth and it's just a straight line up from the Earth, and yeah, arrogant but also incredibly bold. And I can't help but, <laughs> I mean, it is it's awe inspiring, you know, to think. Uh, I mean, people have walked on the moon. That's insane. Yeah, I, I I do agree with that. It is it is bold. Like I'm I'm not trying to take away from that at all. Like because there's just like. <laughs> There's a ceiling on my intelligence that like would prevent me from getting invited to space and from <laughs> trying to send other people to space. And so sure. like it's already magic to me. So I have I have nothing but respect for the ability to do it. Right. But, like I think that yeah, sometimes I, I wonder if like those resources could be better spent anywhere else rather than like exploring the deadness uh, of space. But Yeah, I think that's fair. I think that's very fair. Um reminds me of a uh... An onion headline that I always enjoyed was uh, NASA finds uh, a new star uh, 2,000 light years from public interest. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> but yeah, it's not, it's not uh, amazingly beneficial. But yeah. shit, I mean, in terms of just like applied math and an industry, I mean, it helps people on Earth, I suppose. But, but I hear you there. Yeah, I, I definitely didn't expect the uh, conversation to start here, but I, I'm glad that we both uh, found some yeah. common ground on that. Uh, well, I've always thought about that. Like you saying that has uh, has stuck with me over the years for some reason. Uh, I remember that conversation there at the old annoyance because uh, that was like when I first moved to Chicago and we were palling around a little bit. That's uh, right. And, well, and that's actually a, a very convenient segue to something a little bit more germane to the channel, because we did start out at the annoyance. And could you maybe describe for the 
my my vast audience what was sort of the philosophy of the annoyance as a school if you can remember i know it's it's kind of been a while since we've been there but it has been a while um and and you know it goes without saying that this will be just my uh interpretation or what i recall and i certainly don't speak on behalf of the annoyance sure. uh but i i feel like as a the school the training i think was about empowering yourself um and you know taking care of yourself and by by taking care of yourself you will take care of the other performers on stage and uh so i think it was i found it to, to be focused more on the individual on on the voice your voice as a performer um and and about forcing yourself to discover things through kind of thoughtless action you know um which i, I dig a ton and is you know does doesn't come naturally to me and i feel like you know what i always really dug about the annoyance and and mick is i feel like I feel like they're they're just very open and and I think open to experimentation and um you know if something is edgy I, it's a it's a place it seems to me a place where it's there for all kinds of people and and I I, I always dug very much the feel of that place and I'm saying that in past tense just because I haven't been anywhere for a year, obviously. Right. Uh, yeah. But I assume and I think that it's it has withheld uh, this period, and I hope that's true. But yeah, I think that the annoyance was about empowering the individual, I think, and kind of um, helping them find their voice. Is yeah, I, I, I think I think that's a that's a good breakdown of it. Um, and yeah, I I didn't mean to put you on the spot to speak for. Oh any, sure. Uh, a oh, of course company not. That is not your own, but um, I think and I'm sure like, you didn't. <laughs> this is a gotcha video to, to yeah, trap right. you into some You're sort toasted. Of... <laughs> yeah. Um, no, but what, one of my favorite parts about just going to Chicago was seeing just those different philosophies that all of those schools ended up bringing to their instruction. Because I think a lot of people who are not very familiar with improv come from the perspective that it's like whose line is it anyway and right there's this idea of like you run out there and, and try to come up with a crazy one-liner but it actually ended up being these different schools of thought that sort of responded to each other in different ways because if i understand correctly mick napier got the, the one who started the annoyance for anyone who doesn't know um he got sick of like the io way of teaching which was like very polite and very deferential to like your scene partner and so he was like what if we created this way of doing scenes where you go out there and like you really make a strong statement and let that carry everything yeah i i think that feels right to me uh like as an accurate uh because because i i think I think there's more of a sense of not not fuck the rules or or fuck the convention, but but don't don't be constrained or hindered or don't be told that, you know, don't buy that you're not good because you didn't fit into this place, you know, or that you didn't fit like the rigors of of the Herald or, you know, whatever somebody else was teaching, you know, that there's and you know to your point also about different different philosophies and different conceptions of what improv is i mean it is it's incredibly vast it's like if we're talking about music you know like the the second you say well music is this you know you've just you've closed yourself off to a billion things you know like of what music could be um so i think it was that sense of openness of um you know it can be whatever it wants, you know, and it can manifest itself. However, you nurture it, you know what I mean? Sure. Yeah, yeah. That, 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 is, that is true, because it is like, as as soon as you do try to describe it, you do sort of whether you mean to or not kind of erect walls around like what it what it can be or what it should be. Yeah, so right. It, in those terms. Um, but then on the flip side of it, too, though, um, I think that there are, there's maybe like a, a shadowy line somewhere because like accounting, for example, is not improv. Like we can pretty uh, comfortably put, 
put that on the on the outside of it though and then also just that like humor is the intention with improv too i think that maybe closes it a little bit more specifically even though if that doesn't totally zero in on what it's supposed to be so could, could you speak to that a little bit because this is one of those kind of like more more difficult things and like even though my my channel is a little bit more about writing but i see such similarity between improv and writing and that sort of thing so like can you talk at all about how how do you approach like being funny without going out there and like being uh a clown you know sure sure um well you know like a writing axiom that has always stuck with me is you know you write what you know um and and i feel like uh and humor is so is so slippery, you know, why do we, I was just thinking about this the other day is what what makes you laugh. Um, and there's a difference between laughing and finding something funny. Um, you know, you laugh as like the last thing you do before you cry sometimes, you know, it's like you're, you know, when you're fighting off tears, you laugh, you know, because it's, it's like you laugh to release tension, you know, there's so like tension can build and release and you laugh because you're relieved, you know, or, or you, you laugh out of defense or so. And, and I feel like, especially like a crowd dynamic, uh, I feel like that, that tension release or a cut in timing is funny. And, and then in terms of being funny, um, I think, I think that there is, uh, and back to that, uh, write what you know, I, I think there's just a certain comfort that when you are in your own skin, um, it's just kind of instinct and you just have a sense of, uh, well, you know, shoot. I mean, cause, cause there are sometimes some things are funny because they come together organically. Something has come together and it is surprising to everyone. And that's funny. It's funny because it is, it is a surprise and this, like, it feels like a magic trick has pulled off, you know? Uh, and that's just people paying attention and kind of creating in the same direction. And then lines start to cross and people are seeing these connections, putting stuff together. And it's very funny, very pleasing. We're laughing because it's surprising. And then there's just like natural comedic timing, you know, where we, an expectation was subverted, you know, like everything was going one way and then it kind of pivoted another. And that's funny because we were expecting something different, you know, but then, but it, it it's, it's still done with a sense of authenticity and, and honesty, you know, um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough, it, cause I think, you know, something I say to myself all the time is, and this is gonna sound so stupid, just having prefaced it this way, but is that you can't make that shit up. You know, it's like you go to the zoo, you see a giraffe. You're like, dude, I could never have fucking imagined a giraffe. You know, like you can't make this thing up and same with human behavior. People do ridiculous stuff and it's, you know, and it's hilarious because, it's uh it's idiosyncratic it's it doesn't it's like against what they're trying to do you know um and it's just wacky and i think just people natural their naturalness and the way that jives with other people is just funny for those deviations and expectations um for the tension that it, that is created there like misunderstanding you know um i was I was coaching a team for a while and I, I saw there was like some point in the scene where a guy, he posed a question and, and the respondent, you know, answered in a way that seemed to me like he thought this would be a funny answer, but it also seemed to me like he actually had no idea what the answer to the question was. And so I suggest instead to just, you know, just say that you don't know what the answer to the question, this is a terrible example, but I feel like the honesty of, of people watching, and expecting, you know, oh, this will be a funny answer, only to find that, in fact, not only did they not know the answer, but this guy didn't know the answer. It's like, you know, you see yourself in that, and it's it's funny because it rings true. <sighs> Sorry, this is just gonna be a whole lot of this until. Oh, I mean, th th this is exactly what I what I wanted to do. I like I, oh. I, I thought that was a great answer because I know I I kind of gave you a tough question of like describe this ethereal thing that like when you know what it's there and and when yeah. you don't have well, it it feels terrible so right and that's really you know when people say oh you do improv i can never do that you know i could never get on stage and be funny you know and i and i feel like anybody with that attitude of i'm gonna get out there and i'm gonna be funny is uh that's a frustrating person to play with you know because i think that there is there is just like a natural sense of um 
it's just a little bit more natural than that. You know, effort is unwatchable, you know, uh, efforts hard to deal with and, and any sense of it is kind of, um, uh, unpalatable, I'd say. Yeah. Cause I, I think there's a sense when you're seeing somebody reach too hard to be funny, you almost feel like condescended to in a certain way that it's like you, they, they feel like you can be tricked by something cheap and yeah. Or go ahead. Yeah. No, no, no. I think that's right. Or, or you get a, I, I feel like me as, as the, the viewer, I feel like something is being asked of me and it's, it wouldn't be honest of me to give it, you know, you know, like they, they need something from me. And that makes me, that's not what I'm, that's not what I'm here for. You You're know, to like validate the people on stage. <laughs> yeah. Or you're like, Oh, Oh man, I can't, this is, this can't be this kind of group activity where I'll laugh because you seem to need me to, you know? Um, which is tough because I think that especially in an environment where a lot of people are learning comedy, there are a lot of laughs that are like supportive laughs and, and laughs that like demonstrate like that wasn't really funny, but I'm acknowledging that I knew what you were doing. And, yeah, right. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It can become kind of a game to just be fresh and like laugh if it's funny and not if it's not. Oh, yeah. That um, and then over time you become jaded and you don't laugh at anything. You, you very seldom laugh or you only laugh when it's terrible, you know, uh, but uh, just, yeah, improv. Well, and I think early on too, you know, there's at, at its best, it's very supportive and it's just great to see your friends out there, you know, so you will laugh out of support and you want them to feel comfortable, but then you'll also get the laughs of like somebody drops uh, like a, you know, a Martin Luther reference, you know, and somebody in the back's like, huh? and it's just like, just like, you know, my laugh and you know, I got that joke and I'm signaling to everybody that I got that joke. And that's, that's terrible. Those people, but every, you know, everybody, everybody is some sliver of that person. You know, you got that aspect in you, but like there's, there's signal laughter, all kinds of signals are being sent. Like I, I support you or I get that joke or that was bad, you know? Yeah. I, I just wish they'd cut to the chase and just go, ah, yes, I'm <laughs> yeah. aware. Martin Luther, <laughs> yes, <laughs> intelligent. Yeah. Well, because I've definitely done that too. I, I'm I'm definitely oh. not completely pure in that, but it, I think it's just a funny impulse because I think the ideal is to be totally fresh and unreflective about the way that you do it. But then once you start to think about the process of humor, you can't help but have like the learned laugh and the the oh, yeah. signaling laugh. So. For sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's like, you know, going to a restaurant and you see somebody on their little entry system and you're like, oh, is that squirrel? You know, oh, I know that entry system. Oh, they're going to the drinks. You know, it's like you, you when you see how the sausage is made, you know how the sausage is made, you know, and you're totally. like, mm, that's a very firm casing. You know, you're, you're analyzing it differently. Well, I think it's tough, too, because I think people, especially like when I was in high school, I took my sense of humor very seriously that it was like, I, I know what's funny and like, I won't just laugh at any common drivel, but then ironically that led me to these improv schools that were like, humor isn't intellect. It's, it's funny and silliness. Like that's all in there too. So yeah. like, have you had to navigate that at all? Um, I don't think so. Not, not in that way, because I think I've always, I have always wanted to make people laugh. And I think I was slow to come around to understand that that's fine, that that's something, you know, people would say, I feel like I wanted to push away from it for a long time. And people would always say, you're funny, you know, and I, I wanted to be a, an illustrator. And I remember this guy came in, he was like a, an associate lecturer. And I was asking him about something about illustrating. And he says, you're funny. And I feel like people were telling me, you know, you're, I mean, you're funny. Um, so I don't think I, I had a, I had like a hoity toityness about music, about oh, what I thought music should be okay. and that this was, and, and that wasn't, and, uh, that I have since thankfully outgrown. Um, but I not, I don't think with, with comedy or humor, cause I mean, to your point, it is, I, I feel like you can't control, I think what you think is funny. You know, if there are things that you want to find funny or that you want to say, Oh, I think that's funny, but you can't, you really can't help what gets you. Yeah. 
that that is the thing and and it's yeah because i mean there are those things that it's just like a very complex witty turn of phrase and that'll like earn a chuckle but i think for one sure. of my favorite jokes is literally like what did the horse say when he fell down help i've fallen and i can't giddy up and <laughs> it like i've told it enough times that i don't crack up every time i hear it now but the yeah. first time i heard it i was just like blindsided by how <laughs> like i was kind of expecting it I kind of yeah. knew, like, you, you already smell something bad's about to happen, <laughs> right. and then it just gets you, and, like, yeah, it, it, it defies explanation. <laughs> yeah, it totally does. But then, but also, you know, you being, I assume, a language enthusiast, that's fun, just that little play with language in there, you know, it's like it bends some rule a little bit, and, it like, like there, there's some permission in there where you're like, oh, we can do that, you know, and that's, I feel like it's funny, and at the same time, it your world gets bigger because you're like, oh, uh, that's that's a fun way to play, you know? Yeah, and I, I think I, I've heard it described that way too before, that humor is kind of like, it's like sudden realization of, of knowledge or something like that, that it's like, it happens so quickly and it's so enlightening that you just like, you, you release that energy by laughing. Yeah, yeah, I think that, I think that checks out. Um, Kind of like, have you seen the videos of uh, colorblind guys that that get those? Uh, oh, sure. Yeah, and like they all cry, you know. Yeah. And I just, I just feel like that's a human response to to having your mind blown, you yeah. know, to something that you can't imagine. <laughs> uh, but then your brain is like getting hit with this thing that you had no concept of, you know. And what else does a body do with that? But it cries, and I feel like it's that similar kind of boom hit with a burst you know it's it's fun. like it, this energy is generated you know oh sure I, I i remember um susan messing talking about just like the the different ways that people respond to things that you wouldn't expect necessarily so one of the things that i really appreciated i think it was her level two class at io where she mentioned if one person is doing something on stage that's kind of weird you're like okay but if two people on stage are doing that same weird thing at the same time in the same way, your brain just like lights up. And that's, that's so simple. That's not like, like you, you can understand that concept immediately, but sometimes in those moments when you are reaching for something funny or reaching for some kind of big reaction, you're going to overlook it and, and complicate it, you know? Oh yeah. Big time. Uh, there's a uh, mixed book improvise. He says in a situation, you know, where somebody's on stage doing something like emotion, uh, you have this instinct of, oh, how, you know, how am I going to counter that? Or, you know, how can I elevate that? And to hell with that, just go out there and just do what they're doing, you know? Yeah. And it, it's very much that same thing. And I feel, uh, I love that because I feel like the opposite, it is, there is that sense of effort and contrivance, you know, of the, oh, this, this person came in like with this calculated angle and it's going to work or it's not. And so there's pressure on, on that moment, you know, but then to just go out and match, then not only is that there's a certain pleasingness to your point about that, but then also there's, it's just, there's a togetherness in figuring out and, and discovering together what it is we're doing, you know, or, or where it goes from there. And I, and I feel like that moment to generate discovery is such a, you know, to play from point of inspiration and to play where you're just reacting is the sweet that's the sweet fluid zone where you're just in reaction you're in response to what's happening you're not thinking your, your body starts to sweat it is the fucking jam uh and like once you once you get a taste of it you know then you're you're chasing it for, for forever oh yeah yeah, yeah. It, it, it it's tough too because it's like that that like flow state is so desirable and even if you know don't plan it out beforehand, follow the inspiration. I'll still find myself like in the wings being like, well, you know, maybe I'll just like have a couple things in my back pocket. And like, oh, oh, yeah, you can't not like, <laughs> sure. I have never gone out, you know, to be like, I'm just gonna go out there with nothing. I don't think I've ever done that. You know, I think I've abandoned things or I've jumped, you know, any rule or axiom that I've tried to follow, I've failed at, you know, of course. Uh, well, that, that's what I've always been interested in too with creativity is that like, I, I am a firm believer in that you should learn technique and like kind of hit the gym creatively. But then there is this gap between that and the like inspired 
stuff outside of that technique that you want to get to. So it is this kind of like oscillation between those. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I feel like, you know, hitting the gym, I think just gives you more, I, I think it gives you uh, uh, the potential for higher and more sustained highs. You, you know, once you once you're in that, it just makes you better prepared and, and gives you a bigger vocabulary or a bigger tool set or whatever, you know, metaphor we want to use so that when you're in that state, you know, when you get there, it's just, you're better prepared for it. And I think you just get, cause, cause I would imagine that my, you know, the moments early on in my, uh, career that, you know, were transcendent, it's a overkill word, but that, you know, where, sure kind of rised out of my head. Um, I would, I would hope that they would not compare to later ones, you know, that were much more about more sustained and more of a, an ensemble piece, you know, um, I would hope so. Yeah. It's are, are we going to say something? I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was going to keep talking, but I wasn't going to say anything. I don't think. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, I need to be encouraged to be cut off every once in a while, but, uh, cause, cause this train, it keeps going, you know, it doesn't oh, yeah, it have does. to, but it, it, yeah, right. It's not going anywhere. Yeah. That, uh, that is interesting though. And I, I think that like d discovery is, is definitely something that I've mentioned on this channel a lot too. Cause I always try to bring that into like writing sessions, but then in order to facilitate that discovery, there are some bricks that you need to lay down. And then occasionally those get edited out too. So sure, yeah. Well, and uh, something something I like and I love in the creative process is there are so many analogs. I feel for whatever the discipline is, you know. So like you just made me think of an underpainting, you know, or a sketch. You know, there there's a mix between really being in the the zone with uh, with your color and getting your drawing in place. But before that, you have painstakingly taken measurements. Uh, you know, with your pencil or whatever, or getting the proportion, the, the width of the head compared to the, the width of the shoulders, et cetera. Um, and, and, and all the time you've done that obviously makes it quicker to you so that you're doing that quicker, but you never, you never skip that. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like it, it, those, those lines end up never being seen. And that's not the part of the work that, that you're really in the zone about. Uh, but it's critical and it's important. And, and I think they're also, you know, the principles to, cause you want to set up for that moment. You know, you, you want to, you want to behave in a way that you believe directs you to that, you know, fluid state or flow state, whatever. Sure. Um, and, and they're not even important, you know, it's, it's about getting there and then how you got there doesn't even matter, you know, necessarily. So like, you know, maybe those bricks to your point are left out of the story or, I mean, what's, what's that like? What, what is, can we talk about you? Oh, please. That's, that's the whole reason <laughs> I made this channel. It's, it's all yeah. a pretext to just like, Dope. let me shine. <laughs> yeah. Well, how long have you been writing? When, when did you, like where, last time we talked, I think you were at Great Talent. Oh, wow. Yeah. That, okay. And that might've been, that, that was that probably was... like six years. Yeah. Um, I, I started, I, I guess I've always kind of like dabbled in it kind of through high school. And I did my first serious attempt at writing when I was like 21 with just various screenplays and things like that. And then when I moved to Los Angeles in 2015, I self-published a novella, or I guess I, I started it in 2015 and then finished it in 2017. And I've just been taking it more and more seriously ever since then. So cool. Yeah. Are you still in LA? No. So I left basically due to the pandemic, but also it was, it was really cool and so different from the Midwest. Like I always said, LA is more different than the Midwest than like Chicago was to Kansas city, probably expectedly just geographically. It's, it's so much farther away. Right. And even though it's like really inspiring and things like that. I think I moved out there with the expectation I'd be doing film and then just got really, really into fiction. Yeah. And so the pandemic just inspired me to leave. So I'm hanging out in Kansas city right now, but I'm going to move to Brooklyn in the summer. So. Oh, wow. Well, that's yeah. cool. That's great. Yeah. 
Um, so what do you find, like, what are your writing sessions like? How, how does it feel? I've always been curious about it. Um, when are you having the most fun? So it's, I, I, I've, I've channeled so much improv advice in, in my writing and, and at the time in those improv classes, I had every intention of like performing and making that my main thing, but it ended up just being so analogous to the writing process that I've like taken all of those skills and just put it into that. And so I, love I think of it kind of like you're, you're developing your palette of paints at the very earliest stages. And so you're just like kind of free writing on images that seem fun, you know, and like, uh -huh. I don't worry about plot at all. Some people approach it totally differently where they like outline it first. But sure. for me, it's just like, just free write on stuff that sounds fun. Maybe 90% of it will get cut later, but then, and then you just kind of look for discovery through being uh, specific about the choices that you make in the free writing. So it's like very, very similar to improv in that way. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. That's cool. That sounds very cool. Well, congrats, man. That, um, Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a Brooklyn move. That's, that's very exciting. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I don't, I don't know how it's going to be at all. I have a very vague plan. So it's just, I'm Hell just going to yeah. kind of go there and, and uh, soak up as much as I can. But uh, are, right. are you still in Chicago? Yeah. Cool. Okay. What, what neighborhood in Chicago are you in now? Uh, Lincoln Square. Oh, okay. So there's a, a little park, Winnemac Park. I don't know. If it's, um, I, I'm like at, at Western and Winnemac, roughly. Oh, okay. I remember Winnemac. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, which is hilarious. Cause when I first moved to Chicago, I remember, you know, hanging out at the annoyance, obviously that was, it's pretty close to the lake and then yeah. Western Avenue, which is probably, you know, a mile and a half West seemed the end of the earth to me. Right. You know, it was oh, like, yeah, yeah I went, like I got my car worked on at a place at Western and Foster. And I was like, Jesus, where am I? You know? And now not only is it very close to where I used to live, <laughs> uh, it's just funny, you know, your sense of a foreign place, it just seems so huge and unnavigable. Um, uh, but it's just, it isn't, you know? Oh yeah. Es small. Especially in Chicago. I remember thinking that, that like just different stops on the L seemed uh, an eternity apart. And then once I got a bike, you're just like, what? That's right next to that. Like, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's, the yeah. whole city shrinks. Yeah. Oh, enormously. Once you start biking, man, uh, oh, yeah. you can get anywhere. It, like it's so bikeable and you can get anywhere in about 40 minutes. You know, you can get the, I can get downtown from my house. Oh, do you bike uh, in Chicago? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. So, you, oh, then yeah, you know exactly what it is. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but I remember when I was first here, I was going, you know, like taking all these trains and buses to try, and it, just every place just felt like it was just a straight line from where I was to that place, and there's no overlap or crossing over, you know. Sure. Uh, and then, then you get a sense of, oh shit, I've just been, I've been doing this wrong. So, do you think do you think you'll be in Chicago for the foreseeable future? I don't know. You know, I love it here. I really do. Mm. Um, my Carrie, do you remember Carrie? Is had you, had you met Carrie? Yeah. I don't, I don't know if I've ever met your wife. Actually. Maybe you haven't. Um, did she move after you? She did. She okay. moved after. I think <laughs> that's why. Yeah. 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 I remember you asking me, uh, like it was uh, maybe that same night as the, the space talk, you, you like alluded to the, you know, like, you know, your wife's not here. And I was like, She's coming later. Like Spill we're good. Beans, but... <laughs> yeah, right. Like Mike, what's going on with you? Um, yeah, I think uh, I think I like it more than she does. And in fact, I I know that's true. Okay. So we'll see. I mean, we we both we both we both like it here. I just happen to love it here. But I don't know where we'll go next. You know, we were thinking about L.A. and we were we had actually tentatively planned to do that last year and oh. i'm so glad we didn't because the only reason we would have gone out there would have been for you know film industry stuff and that ground to a halt obviously so that would have um but you know we might might move somewhere closer to family i don't know we might not we might be here forever who knows things might change yeah but we don't have hard plans to do anything just yet i got you yeah yeah it is, it is interesting because I, I feel like in Chicago, there is a lot of like anti-LA mentality. Oh, really? Do, do you not pick up on that or? Um, well, I mean, I think 
I, I've heard the move stigmatized by by grumps who just think people are trying to go out and be famous, you know, mm -hmm. and say, you know, you can do everything here. And, you know, you can't. And it's it's. But I've, I've never really taken that seriously, that criticism, and I've not heard a ton of it, uh, but I've heard a fair amount, I guess. OK, yeah. I, I was just curious because I and, and maybe it was just the either the people that I met or just the the sort of time in my life because I did end up moving out there and like um, spoiler alert I did not turn famous out there so I, I right. subverted everyone's expectations in that so. <laughs> yeah <laughs> just trying to well, nice job <laughs> um yeah have, I mean, have you been out to LA before oh yeah we've been out there a handful of times okay. uh, maybe four or five and we've got a lot of friends out there. So, uh, and Carrie, you know, Carrie really likes the vibe out there, you know, and it's, it's a hard vibe not to like, you know, it's just kind of, it's nice and it's prettier than you imagine, you know, it's prettier than I imagine anyway. Um, culture strikes me as a little strange, uh, yeah. a little cold, uh, maybe superficial, definitely not Midwestern, which I've very much come to enjoy the Midwestern sensibility. Um, yeah. And then just being in your car all the time is kind of my take. It seems like, you know, everybody's constantly in, in your car in traffic. And I don't want to do that. You know, that's that's definitely true. But I feel like if you just have like an ounce of strategic thinking in your mind, then you can figure it out. Like maybe yeah. not in the first year because you're still learning everything and you moved here and you work here. But like, I feel like if you can kind of figure out like, don't buy your groceries at 5 p.m. on a Friday. Oh, sure. Like that. Yeah. You, you, like I didn't find it that hard or, or like of anything I didn't like about LA I wouldn't say that that was like I wasn't always sitting in traffic because I just knew at certain times of day you're like just don't don't yeah, drive to the beach at, on and during rush hour you know yeah. little things like that but right sure that checks out yeah um, but the culture is weird though sorry or what were you gonna say something? oh no well I, I think it just doesn't seem what I love about Chicago is it's so walkable you know and I feel like it instills walking because you're walking to the train, you know, or you're walking to your bus stop. Sure. Or, and then once you get that down, you're like, well, shit, it's just a mile and a half. Like we went back to Kansas City a couple of years ago and, you know, did a, a show somewhere. And then the friends were going to go to this bar. And I said, Carrie, I'm just going to walk to this bar. And she says, you can't walk to the bar. And I said, Carrie, it's a mile and a half, you know, but like we were back on our, our Kansas City brains where we drove everywhere. But like a mile and a half isn't shit, you know, when we're walking around here, you know, we'll walk. You know, you walk that for an afternoon just for fun, you know, but I mean, oh, yeah. I walk probably, I don't know, half a mile to the train, maybe, maybe more than that. So I feel like you're just, you get used to walking and you see walking is, oh, it's actually a pretty solid means of getting around. Uh, so I like that about, about Chicago. And I felt like when we had visited LA, we decided to walk somewhere once, but I guess that was technically in uh, Venice, uh, but it was downright hostile because there was like a, there's a little sidewalk and there was just a concrete wall directly next to the sidewalk. And then it was the road. So, I mean, it, sure. it felt not only was it absolutely not scenic, uh, but it felt dangerous, yeah. you know, like, you know, you couldn't look at houses or yards or stuff like that. It was like a fucking concrete wall and, and traffic. It was like being, it's like when you see a ledge on the outside of an office building and you're outside or, or you're inside, and there's that ledge. It's like, you know, I could stand there, but on the other side of the glass, I may as well be in outer space. Yeah. It didn't make, that really didn't make any sense at all. It was a place that looked like it was fit for a human to stand on, but it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I get that. That's fair. Cause like I, I did a little bit of walking in LA, but I, I just found, I don't know if I necessarily felt unsafe, but it was more of just like the, the most beautiful things and the most ugly things are all right next to each other. Whereas in yeah. Chicago, it's kind of the nice red brick urban environment everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas LA, it's like, yeah, there's, there's great flowers right over there. And then just like miles of strip malls after that. So yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's fair. That's true. Uh, but we liked it out there. I mean, I, I would have tried it. Maybe. <laughs> but you were out there for a few years i was out there for five years yeah wow damn that's a long time yeah it, it went quick too though because like it you kind of get the groundhog day effect because the seasons are not very different right did so, you miss that 
did, did that mess with you or did you miss seasons? You, I would say for the most part, it's great. Cause it's like the coldest it gets is like the forties on the coldest nights of winter. Or maybe right. it kind of dips into the thirties, but like for the most part, it's, it's pretty agreeable, but there is, yeah, I, I guess there's a small part of it that it's like every day is the same and you kind of lose track of time and yeah, sun's always in your eyes. Right. Well, there are worse problems to be had for sure. That's it's the thing. A, that does seem nice. I do like the seasons though. Like it being spring right now, it just, it fills me up. I love spring. Oh, totally. Yeah. yeah. Where, where are in Kansas City are you? I'm actually in Lee Summit. I'm, I'm at my parents' house. I've been here for gotcha. eight months now. So cool. That's, that's a long time to be living at your parents' house, but I am yeah. very grateful well, as well. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you, man. I hear you. And you got a bird? I do. Yeah. So Pringle is, is chilling over here. Let me see if I can uh, see if he'll make an appearance. Hello, Pringle. There we go. So this is Pringle. Oh, he's pretty. Tell him thanks, Pringle. Hi, Pringle. Yeah, so I got I got Pringle in uh, Ventura, California. I had to drive, and I bought him at a, a nail salon. So I, wow. I wasn't totally sure if that was legal or not, but the guy seemed like he needed the money, and I needed the bird. So yeah, yeah, dude, I love it. I love birds. They're fun. Yeah. Well, they're so darn interesting. And they're so, uh, I was just reading something that, uh, you know, because crows obviously are insanely smart and, you know, are smarter than you would think a bird would be. And it was something about like the neural density that they have a ton of neurons, that, that their brains are just much denser than apes, for example. So like it compared, um, you know, because birds, uh, crows make tools, you know, and they can learn to talk and they, they figure out puzzles. So it's like shit you would never think could go on in a small brain but it's just a, a small, dense brain. They're just amazing animals. Yeah, I, I, I think that the disconnect is that it's like, they're not very facial expression oriented. A hundred percent, yeah. You can project intelligence on a dog or, or a monkey or something like that, but with birds, they're, they're like all posture, so. Right, you, you, all you body like, language, you mean? Yeah, or, or, or just like you, a, a lot of people when they spend a little time with my bird, they'll, realize more that like you can you can really get an idea of what they're thinking just by looking at like what he does because if he's chilling you know he's just kind of like this but if he's curious then it's all like yeah right this and 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 a, a lot of like cocked head looking to the side and that sort of thing so I'm, I'm always interested but then also a little disappointed that people are like wow they're actually intelligent i'm like yes of course they are they're, they're yeah. like there's so much going on they can talk you know right yeah um does pringle is he a chatty a chatty guy so he can't say anything intelligible but he he can like we can make noises back and forth and like his little throat bulges out so oh, he, cool. he is technically like making syllables and things like that um i did have a bird actually that just died unfortunately but that i bird... think i saw that on instagram i'm sorry to hear that oh i, I appreciate it yeah yeah it, it was it was kind of uh horrific but uh oh but <laughs> but uh he he could say like full words he could say like hey siri hey cutie lawrence pringle um he could say in my experience which is Whoa. just that seems like there's all kinds of things going on in there you know yeah yeah Hey, have you ever heard of uh, or read about Alex, the gray parrot? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. That dude, um, they, he, they gave him a piece of food he had never had before. And he said something like uh, he combined two words to describe it. So it was like they gave him a banana or as a strawberry. And he said something like uh, banapple, like to try and. So it's like his little brain was actually trying to use the language he had and the attributes associated with those things to describe this other thing. So it's kind of amazing. Like he was, that was communication, you know, like that was, it wasn't repetition. He was using language to try and describe his experience. I, yeah, I mean, I, I just, I love that. I love that. I and do that, too. It blows my whole mind. Anecdote of him just like 
being able to like take the existing information that he had and, and synthesize it. Cause like, I, I don't know. I feel like you hear a lot of scientific rationalists draw this hard line in the sand of like what's going on inside of an animal's brain, which is just like, don't get me wrong. I don't know shit about science, but, but it's right. like humans don't understand our own consciousness. The, the human right. interior is such an unnavigated space. And, and we can like map neurons and things like that, but there's, there's still such a divide between the experience and the, the like reading on the graph that they hold up. And so like the idea that somebody could just definitively say for an animal, no, simple repetition, nothing's going on. It, it right. just, it, it, like, I don't see how you could be so certain. Yeah. I, that, that seems arrogant. And it seems, it also seems like anything it just seems like it's all it's it's it strikes me as all the same it's just layers of complexity like i feel like anything that they might say about oh it's just it's repetition it's just uh, a response yeah it seems like that could be true of of humans it maybe is just to our eyes more complicated but that's i mean it seems like it's all the same stuff you know it's all the same uh stimulus response you know nobody's you know you you something stimulates you, it fires off all the, all the sweet chemicals, you know, and, and you, you have a response. And I, I think there's, it's just a degree of how complicated are the systems at work. You know what I mean? Oh, a hundred percent. And, and th th there's like, there's like four different directions. I want to take this right now. But the, the last one that I thought of was I I'm a substitute teacher right now. And oh, nice. um, some of my students brought up in class the other day that they don't believe in Helen Keller. They, they don't believe, like, they, they believe she existed, but they think that her being an author and it, capable of language even is a, a fabrication. And this, I guess, comes from, like, a TikTok conspiracy, but oh it reminded God. me of this because, like... What a day and age. It, it sort of asks the question, and, and again, like, just to clarify, I 100% believe in Helen Keller. I guess I've never really doubted it, but... Right. But since... <laughs> somebody presented that like some people don't believe it was there it makes you it makes you because like they, they had reasoning too it wasn't just like a fake news kind of thing they were like there's a a certain amount of intelligence that relies on this sort of like spatial information that you get from your eyes and like oral information from your ears and so if she didn't have either of those how would she ever have learned to speak you know yeah or how would she have learned to do you mean speak in quotes oh yeah you're right i use the word speak but i mean more think right how, interior sub, sense of self things like that yeah, yeah right right um yeah that's a, that's a hell of a that's a hell of a question are you a, a radio lab fan uh i've listened to before but i, I haven't listened to a lot of their stuff I, i'm an early radio lab fan uh from you know 10 years ago or more, but there's this episode about a man, a deaf man in, uh, he was an indigenous man in South America who essentially grew up to be an adult without language. He, he was deaf and the, his little community had no means to teach him language. And so he basically lived and it's, uh, it's the point of view that the story is told from the point of view of this woman who worked with him to teach him sign language and the process they went through and he didn't get it and he didn't get it. And then he, she says that all of a sudden he slams his hands down on the table and he points at the clock and she makes the sound for clock and he points at the door and she makes the sign for door. And, and she says he just bursts into tears wow. that there's, that there are names, and I feel like that is the best story of just somebody's world just got enormous, like immediately, you know, that there are words for things and that he had never, I mean, can you imagine to not have, I can't even imagine, you know, that's, it's, it's unimaginable, yeah, that's <laughs> literally to think like you don't, you don't have words for things, you know, and it's like, how critical is that to human thought? You know, how like to have a name, you know, because we're such we're labelers, you know, and and uh, and that's, you know, even even like we, when you're learning an accent to have a word for the middle part of 
a word so that you can identify it helps you understand how the word is structured and it helps you it's like to have reached adulthood with none of that i mean what was that person's life like what is their what what is their brain like what 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 did they think you know well, yeah that, it's just like that <laughs> it's crazy that's that is just absolutely fascinating because that does seem like it's a case of somebody who is is not having thoughts in the way that we usually think of it such as like having a a line of monologue going on in your head yeah but right apparently some sort of intelligence and because he's an adult we we can assume even with a ton of help he's making decisions and and still like engaging with the world around him and yeah i mean he's fucking he's, he's alive you know he made it yeah yeah and and you know presumably he's got yeah so uh he's still got like some naked machinery that was that was working for him I, and he was able to acquire language you know so it's so interesting but that that makes me that seems to to kind of be similar to the the helen keller situation of someone who didn't have any of the inputs um and you know how would you develop a sense of self or even um uh, i guess just from reading what's where do you land on the helen keller thing like what, what when you talk with these kids well i I don't know a ton about her story, but if I remember correctly, the big breakthrough that they had with her was was water. And so even though she didn't have sight or sound, she still had sensory information and, and like being able to tactily touch things. And so like I think you you can develop a spatial understanding of something just by like dragging your finger across your arm, you know? Like sure. And and, and it's so rudimentary, it sounds silly to describe, but like you learn the basic idea of differences between things by just being like, well, this is here. And then like, this is here, you know, and that is a basic grammar that sort of underlies the way that language works is by dividing things into differences and labeling them accordingly. And so I think eventually how she ended up communicating with people is that they'd sign language into her palm. And so right. that rings a bell. If she can, you know, develop the most basic things like wetness is this symbol, then they can orient her toward other things. And then once you get kind of a network of symbols associated with tangible things, I imagine you can eventually extrapolate interior experience and associate that with symbols. And then you're off to the races, I think. Yeah, that's wild. It's crazy, right? <laughs> it is crazy. Yeah. I, I feel like this is not, uh, this is tangentially related, but uh, I was reading an, an article once about um, nutrition based blindness in kids in India and how it's, it's oh, okay. essentially reversible to, to a degree. I don't, you know, I'm going to, uh, but they had taken a, uh, a young man who had been blind and they were able to, I think it was a surgery, reverse his blindness. And in his, as he was recovering, they, they had him blindfolded cruelly, <laughs> no, uh, but they, they gave him a, um, a sphere to hold in his hand uh -huh. and, and if, you know, they're talking about it and then they take it away and they put it on a desk next to a pyramid and they take off the blindfold and they ask him, which were you just holding? And he had no idea. He couldn't uh -huh. pick. Because he he didn't have that pairing of of sight and touch, like they weren't connected, you know. So so like he didn't have a like a symbol in his mind for the pointy, like you know he didn't have any pictures. That's that's wild, yeah. Because I, I take <laughs> yeah. that for granted so much of that, like that's so interesting. Yeah. That's why, so that had to develop, you know, cause you'd think that people would just be like, oh, wow, you know, holy shit, you know? And he said that people were just flummoxed. Like they couldn't, uh, it, it wasn't like falling into line. They had to ease people in. Uh, they couldn't tell, they couldn't tell two dimensional images from, you know, three dimensional spaces, you know, like crazy shit. Uh, very fascinating stuff. That, that's something that I do f think about frequently that like a lot of, a lot of 3D space is something that you sort of 
project onto what is literally a 2D visual field of experience in front of you. And yeah. like, it's, it's, it's a pretty faithful projection to the way that like you would end up go about and like touching things. And so it like, it works obviously, but it almost takes effort to remind yourself that it is 2D and that like, just uh, fr from a strictly color perspective, everything's as close as everything else. It's, it's like, it's all right there on, on your Yeah. Mind. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's wild. That's fun. That's fun. It's got a lot trippier than I expected. Yeah. Sweet. <laughs> um, okay. So in, in our last three minutes, then let's, let's up the ante even more. Oh, okay. um, what, what are your thoughts on the afterlife on God, on anything oh. transcending the material plane? Wow. Um, Must be inspiring and unforgettable. Well, shit. Uh, I think almost rather unfortunately, I think, I, I believe that, you know, and this is ever evolving, mm -hmm. of course, um, but I think this is it. I, I believe in a physical universe. I think it's uh, things physically interacting with one another. Uh, I don't. I don't believe in ghosts. I don't believe. Uh, I don't believe in God. I don't. I, and I, I don't believe in an afterlife. I think. I think this is it. And I and I think we're. I you know I I ultimately I don't believe in. I just I just and it's it's not that I've chosen. It just doesn't square with what I think, with what makes sense to me, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I don't, I think ultimately we're, we're at the whim, we're at the whims of our, the biology of our brains and our bodies. I, I think, I think choice is an illusion. I think, um, yeah, I think we're, I think we're just meat bags that are kind of aware of the ride we're on for better or worse. And, uh, and I think it's, it's pretty I think it's pretty cool. That is the thing, because I, I think atheism can kind of get a, a bad rap for being too reductive. But like, if, if we're to believe in atheism, it's actually kind of crazier than anything else, because it, it just it makes it seem like one, the whole universe being here seems as, as like by total happenstance is super crazy and unfathomable. But also the fact that you would arrive in a locus of experience and have all of these things that you inherit that can organize the world into sense for you for that to spontaneously arise is just insane like just it certainly it seems it you know it seems insane um but then also when you when we're talking about the scale of time that we're talking about mm -hmm. it also doesn't seem that unlikely you know uh, of uh, given enough time everything will happen you know uh that that's that's a very reduced um but i feel like it it isn't unlikely i mean in that it happened i think it is it is is proof of that and i bet you know i once i, I saw this article recently and it said uh the milky way is likely littered with dead civilizations and it was speculation um but it's you know basic uh thinking about fermi's paradox you know if, if there's if they're out there where are they and the fact is that they they didn't make it you know there is there's an event you know, an extinction event or a threshold that a civilization is unable to uh, get beyond. And the writer of that article said the, that the, the threshold that they think is themselves. You know, there, there, there's a penchant for self-destruction that seems to be um, coincide with a, a high intelligence. Whether or not that's true, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's obviously we don't have, I don't, I, I don't think human brains have the human beings have the brains to make sense of the scale. Obviously we don't, you know, the numbers, like when we're talking about a trillion, you know, is, it's just a word, uh, that the, the real sense of what a trillion is, especially light years is it's unknowable. It's, a, it's, it's insane. Um, why did, why did I start teeing off on all this garbage? But I mean, so I, I feel like religion largely has just been a control mechanism for human beings or, or like a, a way folks that, 
you know, we, we want answers. We need answers. And maybe science is the new religion of the day, and we're no different than the you know, Egyptians who had their their gods. But I think that's also, you know, it's it's a projection of what they want, you know, of 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 their own values, you know, of um, of what they want their life to be, and, and less about, you know, uh, a strict interpretation of what's going to happen after, you know. I don't know. I'm just, I'm, it's all unknowable, I guess is where I'm landing. And, and we don't, I don't think we're, we don't have the hardware to know or understand. And there's just so many. So I guess I'm agnostic, but I think I'm atheist. Oh, uh, a quote I like is um, it takes, takes, you got to have more faith to be an atheist than a deist because you have to have faith in your own conviction, which makes you a fool. You know, because anybody. So I think that was I think that was said against atheists, which and you know, it makes sense. You know, so I, I certainly can't rule anything out. But I also, you know, I don't. I I've not been compelled to change my mind on any of that stuff. And in a way, I'd kind of like to, because there's like a certain brutality to it. You know, uh, the finality of it is hard to swallow. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't know. It's also it's also kind of gives it a. A, a more urgent beauty. Yeah, I, I think that's a very good answer. Yeah. Well, thanks. Uh, that was, I think that was five minutes that I was just <laughs> blabbering. Continue. But you know, that's hard. That's, that's hard shit. I don't, I don't really have that um, nailed down into obviously concise thoughts. It's just a lot of spewing. Sure. Yeah. Well, that, that's always, I, I think, why it's an interesting question is like, because it, it is so unknowable, but I, I feel like nobody is left blank when asked that question. Like it, it's, it's definitely something everybody thinks about for to sure. a certain extent. So, yeah. What do you think? Where are you at? I, I think I'm like, it, it, it sort of depends. I'm, I'm very wishy-washy on it. I think that in terms of like a strict reading of the truth, I'm like a reluctant atheist because and uh, re reluctant because I like the imaginative quality of drawing a big picture of the cosmos and, yeah. and there being the sense of order and fate. That's all super fun and inspiring. Yeah. Um, and I think that's why I said uh, begrudgingly or whatever I said that I'm unfortunately, because I feel like it, it kind of cuts out some great, you know, and I don't mean this, um, some great imaginary stuff, you know, some great stuff that is beautiful to believe. Yeah, that that's the thing. There's a, a, a guy I read my freshman year of college, I think it was William James, that he, he sort of says that it's like, it's not about it being real, but it's kind of about reaping the benefits of living as though it's real. Right. That and checks so out. like, I, I think if, if it's framed only in terms of like, we're trying to create an accurate reading of the universe, then and in and, and, and those case, or in that case, I'm totally comfortable saying I'm an atheist in terms of that. But yeah. I wouldn't go as so far to brand myself as somebody who's quick to cut out any sort of discussion of like spirituality or anything like that, because I think a lot of the utility in religion comes from more of like coaching yourself through hard moments and... And yeah. And, and also I feel like, uh, surrendering, you know, to it's, it's an acknowledgement that you're not in control, you know? Sure. And, and I think that's, I, I feel like the desire and need to control is such a source of struggle, you know, for, for people, for me individually. And so I feel like that to, to give that up and to, I, I think that that is empowering in a way, you know? Yeah, and I, I think it it sort of like strategically displaces your ego too. That like right. if you can evoke a god in your head, um, even if you recognize it's totally imaginary, I think it it's it it can be enough to like get out of your own way. Yeah, and it's tricky because I feel like that can so quickly turn into well, God told me this, and God told me that like you need to suck my dick right now, and and like. It and, and there's no doubt that's happened a lot in, in human sure. history. So like, I wouldn't necessarily advise other people to do that, but like, I have never used God to do that. And so like, I'm comfortable evoking that for my own purposes, I guess. Yeah. But it gets sticky as well. 
Yeah, it does. Oh, interesting. Interesting way to land that. Total accident, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I know what you mean. That you can you can kind of choose to believe that that's an interesting point of view from William James. Uh, and, and I get it. Huh? God oh, told me you at church on that you have to suck my dick. Oh, <laughs> oh no, <laughs> We both did bits at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Classic. That's yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, we we hit about an hour. Do you do you feel like you have any uh, parting words? Do you have any? Oh man, well, it's, it's really been a pleasure to talk to you, man. Yeah, this has been great. Yeah, this has been really fun. Um, yeah. I feel like we could talk. All, you know, it meandered quite a bit. I hope you don't mind. I feel like we could. You know, I like I like talking. It was fun talking about all that stuff. And I regret that I'm not as concise as I'd like to be. But that's the nature of uh, of where I'm at right now, I suppose. I mean, it's big, big ideas to try and wrangle, you know, and it's hard to be concise about that shit. Well, that's, I, I mean, honestly, that's the goal with it. I, I do an interview style to sort of take the pressure off the other person to like let them, you, you know, engage. And also I find it's easier for me to be more sharing in conversation in the format of like an interview. Whereas otherwise I'm just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's my ideas. It's like, I think the, the Zoom interview format is much more conducive to like throwing it back to the other person, you know? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, well, time flew, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. And we, yeah. we got into a bunch of stuff I did not expect. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, hope we, I hope we got into enough of, enough of the stuff that you did expect. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it's like, it's, it's, it's for fun, basically. But yeah, like, yeah I, I think we did. We did. We talked about improv, philosophy of creating a scene and things like that. Well, then how about at the end, just in case, do you have any general improv advice? Because one thing I wanted to mention, I don't know how can, uh, elegantly I'm inserting this, is that I remember you did a scene at the annoyance once that I've never forgotten where you might even remember this. You entered the scene and you were a mechanic tuning up a scooter and, and you were like, you got to keep her below 40 or else she'll start squealing. <laughs> <And then laughs> it, that just became the refrain of the scene. Like it's, it meandered about the character relationships. And then you were like, yeah, but you know, if you go above 40, then she'll start squealing. <laughs> I don't know if you remember that at all. But... I have no memory of that. Oh, that's ridiculous. <laughs> it's funny. It's weird the shit that, that sticks out or sticks with you for whatever reason. Um, so closing thoughts you asked about? Or, or just anything, because I, I guess like um, just speaking of like, because we, we talked a whole lot about improv, but for the purposes of my channel, which has more to do with like writing and fiction and things like that, what do you feel like are those golden moments in a story? Because we already kind of talked about um, how to enter a scene and, and not worry about being funny too much and, and sort yeah. of getting into that flow state. But I guess more, maybe more as like an audience member and having experienced stories in that way, like what, what are those moments and talk on that a little bit. Well, a couple, of, a couple of authors I've recently read that I've gotten that sense from from reading, if you don't mind me taking it in that direction. No, sure. Um, George Saunders. Do you ever read George Saunders? He he wrote one of my favorite short stories, but I think it's the only one of his that I've read called The Falls. Uh, yeah, that checks out, dude. Um, I love that guy. Yeah. Uh, he is he is absolutely one of my favorite authors because uh, a the dude starts smack dab in the middle of a story, and you, the reader, don't know anything. And, and the author, who it's often told from a, a protagonist's point of view, makes no effort. You know, you're assumed to be up to speed at the start of the story. Of course, you are not. Uh, but these pieces fall in, and you're just thinking, where does this guy, where, where has he come up with these fucking, with these, these ideas? Um, would you, would you let me read you one of his stories? Please. Th this is the most appropriate forum for this kind of thing. 
and it'll give me time to wipe Pringles poop off my shoulder too. Hell yeah, classic Pringles. <laughs> All right. You ready? Yes. Okay. I'm going to do it. Come on. Okay. <clears throat> Every year, Thanksgiving night, we flocked out behind Dad as he dragged the Santa suit to the road and draped it over a kind of crucifix he built out of metal pole in the yard. Super Bowl week, the pole was dressed in a jersey and Rod's helmet, and Rod had to clear it with Dad if he wanted to take the helmet off. On the 4th of July, the pole was Uncle Sam. On Veterans Day, a soldier. On Halloween, a ghost. The pole was Dad's only concession to glee. We were allowed a single Crayola from the box at a time. One Christmas Eve, he shrieked at Kimmy for wasting an apple slice. He hovered over us as we poured ketchup, saying, good enough, good enough, good enough. Birthday parties consisted of cupcakes, no ice cream. The first time I brought a date over, she said, what's with your dad in that pole? And I sat there blinking. We left home, married, had children of our own, found the seeds of meanness blooming also within us. Dad began dressing the pole with more complexity and less discernible logic. He draped some kind of fur over it on Groundhog Day and lugged out a floodlight to ensure a shadow. When an earthquake struck Chile, he lay the pole on its side and spray painted a rift in the earth. Mom died and he dressed the pole as death and hung from the crossbar photos of mom as a baby. We'd stop by and find odd talismans from his youth arranged around the base. Army medals, theater tickets, old sweatshirts, tubes of mom's makeup. One autumn, he painted the pole bright yellow. He covered it with cotton swabs that winter for warmth and provided offspring by hammering in six cross sticks around the yard. He ran lengths of string between the pole and the sticks and taped to the string letters of apology, admissions of error, pleas for understanding, all written in a frantic hand on index cards. He painted a sign saying love and hung it from the pole and another that said forgive. And then he died in the hall with the radio on and we sold the house to a young couple who yaked out the pole and the sticks and left them by the road on garbage day. Wow. Dude, that's a fucking trip, isn't it? Now, now that you've read this too, I have read this before. So, Oh, great. Yeah. But and dude, the, the specificity the seeming randomness, uh, and then like just a glimpse, like we found within ourselves the seeds of meanness. Like it's 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 human, it's it's just like it's conversational. The subject matters, I mean, you couldn't like I don't know how you think of that, and it's so incredibly specific. Yeah. Uh, I love that combination, you know, like especially that specificity because it. Ah, uh, I mean, it just gets my mind because like it, it rings so true. All of that. And I feel like it really just speaks to the. The strangeness of, of human behavior. Uh, I don't know that that story gets me, man. And so many of his do. Yeah, well, because it, it's it's very familiar and relatable, but then also very otherworldly, too, that it is. Yeah, like, we can it's like dystopian. Of, yeah, yeah. And I, I think the way you described it before you read it, too, is, is perfect of that, like, he sort of just thrusts you into it and doesn't really explain, but just yeah. expects you to be along for the ride. Yeah, yeah. He acts as though you've been there the whole time, you know, and not in a way that's arrogant. I mean, it's just, uh, I love that sense of engagement, you know, I love, I love, and I feel like that's also what what's cool about improv, I, you know, just the idea that so much of the story is in the mind of the viewer you know so much of that happens in the imagination of the person taking it in and when you engage that um you know that kind of investment is i mean it's palpable in a live setting you know and but i think that's what makes stories or books so enduring in your mind is like you've created this space you know in your own imagination and you've lived in it you know and you know these people um and so it's like it's it's intimate when when you get that connection in there and uh so like to be to be reaching and looking for meaning and trying to uh make sense of this information that's coming to you all while you know it's a very it's like an exercise um 
it, it just hits you in a lot of places, you know, and your, your brain's trying to make sense of it, trying to, you know, make a face in that cloud. Um, but it, it feels true. I don't know. I just love that. I, and that strikes me as such a, it seems so simple. And I wonder how long it took him to write that. Yeah, it, it, it seems very vulnerable too, in just him kind of like trusting himself to let it be that because yeah. there is, there would be an impulse. Like, I feel like if I had by some grace of God, come up with that kind of imagery for my plan, for my story, there would be a second half where like, I explain to the audience what the poll is and yeah, right. And like connect the dots for them. But it, I, I think that like this short story, but a lot of short stories that are really successful do give you such a specific emotional impression and effect, but also sort of resist an interpretation, you know, like it, yeah. it, it's so detail driven that you, even though it evokes so much more than the sum of its parts, you almost don't want to ruin the magic by writing out that essay and, and telling you what each of the pieces mean. Yeah. And, and um, I love that. I love that in art generally. Um, and I feel like short stories are great because they also shy away from resolution. You know, it's like, that's mm -hmm. not what they're about, you know? So it's, you know, you've just like flitted into a space to see something and then you flit out, you know, but what you've seen is complex. It has a past and it has a future, but you don't know what those are necessarily. You, you get glimpses of, you know, you get hints of relationship by the way through interaction or by like the terse use of somebody's name, you know, yes, David, you know, it's so like, you know, there's history. You don't know what it is. Um, I love that. You know, I love that not knowing, but it being there. And I, I love, um, you know, I feel like the Coen brothers are masters of this in movies where it's, you know, they've, you know, everything has been done deliberately, uh, but the whole eludes you a bit. Mm -hmm. You don't know why, but, I, but you don't care. You know, um, there's, I, I like that so much that, the, and I feel like the short story is kind of, is perfect for that. That's just a moment, you know, it's just a, a very brief glimpse of something that has a much bigger life than what you're seeing, you know? Yeah. And, and it, it is, it, it's just all the more mysterious and intriguing too, that it doesn't have a, a resolution that it's like, it gives you just enough to make your mind go reeling, but then yeah. not any of that finality. Yeah, right. It, you know, because I feel like so seldom are we really given to that satisfaction, you know, or we don't. Sure. That seems true to life to me, you know, is that uh, things don't really end, you know, they just kind of change or, or you don't know how things, I, I don't know. I don't know. What, what's your favorite Coen Brothers movie, if you had to pick? Oh, dude, No Country for Old Men, I think. I think okay. that was because I just thought about that forever after. Yeah, talk uh, about a lack of resolution. That, that yes. ending is just very like... Dude, yeah. And then I woke up, boom. You know, and like the dude is out of his element. He's uh, he's done, you know, he's out to pasture. That's such an interesting, he's so unmoored. He's so destabilized, you know? Um, yeah, I thought that movie was, was really great. And that that scene at the at the gas station um where anton sugar asked the guy the the gas station attendant you know how much he's ever lost on a coin flip oh okay yeah yeah dude just where that scene starts and where it ends is just incredible you know it's just like it starts so innocuously and then just slowly the stakes get so fucking high by the end of that scene but the gas station he, he never is quite sure exactly what they're talking about yeah. but he knows he's in danger, you know, like it's, it turns on him, but it's subtle and it's suspenseful and it's intense. And the, the, I mean, the Coen brothers are so good at just getting people that's, that are authentic, you know, like it seems like they actually just went to that guy's gas station where he's worked for 40 years and be like, Hey, sure. can we shoot this here? And will you be in it? You know, it looks that way. So it has, everything looks just effortless and perfect when of course none of it was. Oh yeah. It's um, yeah, I love that design. scene. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Um, so, whew, yeah, I love that movie. Uh, but I, I mean, I'd watch any of them. 
mm-hmm. obviously. What about you? I, I got to say Big Lebowski. Like, it, oh yeah, it. I think it, it's obviously like an, an enormously popular movie or, or cult classic, I guess more accurately. And it's obviously very funny, but it's one of those movies that, like, I think just gets more complex every time you watch it. And I got to rewatch that. Yeah, it's it's like. It's just one of those things that, like, you, you you know you love it when you're watching it, and then it's over, and then you're kind of like, I don't know if I could really tell you what that movie was about, or even what the plot was, like, let alone any interpretation. Like, it's 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 just too complicated, but in that noir way where you kind of don't care all, yeah. all the twists and turns, but... Um, yeah, I don't know. Every, every time I see that movie, I catch something that I hadn't seen the time before. And I, I just love the trope of like the dumb guy getting caught up in a big conspiracy. That's just a blast to me. So yeah. 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 Got to go with the big, yeah, fuck it, man. Oh yes. Fuck it. <laughs> That's what you young people say to everything. <laughs> I think that all the time. Well, and then him in front of the, the fireplace crying about his life, the, the big Lebowski that is. And he's like, do my tears surprise you, Mr. Lebowski? Does, and he's like, what, what, what makes a man? Can a man cry? I, 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 I'm butchering it. It's, it's been a while since I've seen it, but he's, he's basically just like, yeah, I mean, I guess that and a pair of testicles, like that's, yeah. that's what makes a man. So right. I, I don't know. I, I love that movie. Yeah. I gotta, I gotta rewatch it, man. I don't know if I've ever, I don't know if I've ever seen the whole thing in one sitting. Really? Yeah, I feel like I I'm ashamed to say that. It is like longer than you expect. It's it's one of those that like it it kind of feels like a romp, but then you watch it and you're like, there's like a lot of sequences and and yeah. moments and locations and like yeah, right. Yeah, it's lots of twists and turns. Yeah, too. Yeah, I think that that's a line in the movie actually where where. <laughs> because that, that's why i love it so much is that like they keep asking him to like explain himself and how he's gotten to this point and he can't do it because he's like the, he's like what are you blathering about he's just like uh i, I mean there's a lot of uh, he said she said a lot of, a lot of twists and turns like i i don't even know <laughs> so like it ends up kind of being aware without breaking the fourth wall in that way yeah right yeah yeah right because we we relate to him you know he's our point of view Oh yeah, well, and and it's just such a fun subversion of noir, which is like usually has the slick detective that has his own code, and and he's right. outsmarting everybody else, but he's at the center of all of this, and is literally too dumb to even keep up with the narrative action, but still somehow ends up like, because there, there's the scene too where the other private eye is tailing him, and asks him how he learned all his secrets because he's he's playing all the sides against each other and, and is outsmarting everybody at every turn. And he's just like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm just <laughs> flying by the seat of my pants. Yeah. That's great. Big Lebowski, man. Got to rewatch it. Yeah. Uh, and dude, check out, uh, if you feel so inclined, check out more of George Saunders. He's got a couple of books. He's got several books. Um, one of my favorite stories, I think it's called Sea Oak. Sea Oaks is in his... Um, pastoralia short story book okay um and then his novel lincoln and the bardo i thought was fantastic i loved that book i've I've heard of that one that one that one seems up my alley too it's very like i mean anything buddhism bardo related i I think is fun so yeah well we'll see i don't know um just go into it with an open mind which i'm sure you would uh but but i thought that book was, was fabulous and he's a dude that he, he just seems like such a discovery type writer to me that sure. he's like, he just seems like he's having fun and finding stuff while he's writing. Did, did you say you'd read The Falls? Because that, that is one that really stuck out to me in college that I read. I don't think I have read The Falls. It's, it's incredible. Like I, I won't, I won't spoil it for you, but it ends up kind of playing with that same ambiguity that you sort of pointed out in in the one about the pole and it like it's just about this like this guy who's really neurotic and in his head and like when he crosses a campus full of young students he's really in his head about not looking at any of them so nobody thinks that he's a predator and 
he is contrasted with this other character who's very self-assured and um, carries around a book of archetypal visions because he's so fleshed out in his interior. That's how I re read it anyway. But then both of them encounter this runaway canoe that's about to go over the waterfall. And I, I won't tell you what happens, but it's just like, it, it ends in such a way that like, it feels definitive, but then the kind of the more that you look at it, you're like, wait a minute. Like, right. He, he's so good at that. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah no, I, mean, I cut you off and I'm sorry. Well, well, I, I, I stopped myself too. Cause I kind of, I didn't, I didn't want to say much more oh. than that, cause it's, it's not a very long story either. So right. if you're going to read it, I, I didn't want to spoil the ambiguous ending. I, I will read it. I, I think I've, uh, I've read most of his stuff, I think. And I think what I love about him so much is what the story seems to be about isn't what the story is about, you know? So like the, what the story is about rears its head about half to three quarters in most of the time, most of the things that I've read, it's like, oh shit. Oh, this is what, this is what you're playing with is this thing, but we're way in at this point. Yeah. Uh, and most of that has to do with the, the protagonist point of view of the thing. You know, uh, it's so, I don't know. It's so cool. I wonder like where he starts his process is interesting. It must be. Yeah, it, it, it is. It's, it's one of those things that it's like, since it's so simple again, it's like, it's, it's such a, a, a good display of, of vulnerability because like you, I, or at least I, on the other hand, feel such a need to dress up everything that I write. Whereas like, okay, well, if you didn't like that or didn't get this, then at least I've given you some kind of fanciful design that yeah. looks crafted and, and, and well composed and, and that sort of thing. But his is like so spare and so evocative and and says so much with so little. So it is, yeah, he's, he's extremely yeah. good. Well, yeah, that economy, it's all, it's all about economy. And that's, uh, we just watched, uh, Karen and I just watched the movie Monk, Mank. And he's got a line that's in there. He says, um, if I'd had more time, I'd have written a shorter letter. <laughs> and that, yeah and that's such a great fucking line and it's so that's true witticism <laughs> yeah yeah and yeah very much uh but you know just that the making something simple is hard you know yeah yeah that's uh, that's and, advice i struggle with too because like a lot of the writers who inspired me are very into like really long flowery sentences and things like that and so yeah i'm still an advocate for that but yeah, it's like it, th there is a, a lot of just pain involved in, in really getting it down to just the, the bare essentials. Yeah, right. Well, and you know, um, and even like in that, uh, that's not to, to favor one thing for another. It, it's all about what what your ends are, you know, what uh, what you're going for. Huh. That is true, yeah. Cause, cause like, I think at its best, some of that longer prose that is more stylized ends up emulating human speech a little bit more because uh -huh. there, there is something that some simple prose, it, it kind of like bugs me when it's so terse that it's distracting. And yeah. like Hemingway, for example, I don't really like because there's, I feel like there's nothing for me to grab onto almost by design. He's like right. intentionally building just the, the most dry, in my opinion, anyway, it, whereas like, it, I think it could benefit from like a little more symbolism and, and fanfare, you know? Yeah, sure. Well, sure. I mean, that's, that's certainly a valid point of view. And, and if you think about, you know, Shakespeare, for example, you know, it's not, I mean, that's obviously way on the other side, but so yeah. much about that is, you know, the illusions in the poetry, you know, it's the yeah. craft of of writing these sentences and, and the, I mean, it, it's completely the other side and, and like how, how human emotions are couched in, in metaphor and poetry. And it's like, a, so it's like a few different things are happening at once, you know, and you just achieve a different end that way, you know, and it's incredibly dense and rich, um, which, yeah, it's just a different, like, you know, you don't sit down and, and read uh, a Shakespeare the way you would a Hemingway. You know, it's not like a, a page turner on the beach. You know, you're like, sure. for me anyway, I'm like, what the fuck did I just read? You know, and then I read it a bunch more. And I've only done this a handful of times. Like, I'm not sitting around reading Shakespeare. But when I do, I'm like, dude, I, I get into this. Because, like, oh, playing yeah. with language 
a word, you know, you can say something and make it mean whatever the hell you want. Uh, that's pretty fucking cool. That's it's, it's powerful. And it's, it's an interesting, an interesting tool. So to sit down and think like, man, there's a lot of shit packed in here and it's all with play of language, you know, uh, quite flowery. So there's room for all kinds, man. That's right. Yeah. I, I think that that same thing with like Aaron Sorkin, of right. People just like having dialogue where everybody is just as smart as Aaron Sorkin and just have these like fluid, beautiful responses. Nobody ever takes a second to think they're just right. like, boom, but, but, it, and it's like, it, it's a little unrealistic unless you're just hanging out with the most high achieving intelligent people in the whole world. But that's just the aesthetic. Like, right. I don't know if you yeah. necessarily in, engage with Aaron Sorkin's media in order to have like a true to life conversation where everybody's just, you know, all the ums, ands and, and things like that. It's like, you go in there to kind of be swept away in this big yeah. language game. Yeah. Right. It's not about, you know, it's not different shades of realism. It's storytelling, you know, and it's, you're yeah. telling a story and there's, it has a feel to it, you know, mm -hmm. and, and you feel a certain way watching it. You know, and so, so you achieve that any number of ways, you know, you can just relay the events. Um, so, yeah, that's to judge it on a rubric of, well, how true to life is that? I mean, well, fuck, the Marvel movies were the biggest movies of the past, you know, five years. You know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, that that is. That's a very interesting way to to think about that. Can can you think of what's what's the last movie that you've seen that really blew you away? Um, uh, I'd say one night in, and I think it's one night in Miami. I don't know if it blew me away, but it was, it's about a night that Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X and, um, Sam Cooke, and I don't remember who the fourth guy is, but it strikes me as kind of like a, like a Socratic, it, it's so much of it takes place in their hotel room. And it's what I imagine are imagined dialogues about the points of view that they may have espoused, you know, as to uh, be it um, Islam or the black movement, if that's what that's called. Um, but it, but it was it was like an interesting it, it it watched kind of like I thought like a thought experiment you know if we had these even though i think there's they did have a night together i think historically uh but but you know what would these these titans in their own disciplines what how might their worldviews have what would they have talked about knowing what we know about them uh it struck me as a really interesting kind of thought experiment and it was uh, really well acted and put together and the guy who played muhammad ali i just loved him he was fantastic hmm. um so i thought that was a, i thought that was a really interesting movie just in terms of of thought i'm trying to think so what's it called again because that that does sound interesting it, sounds it was i think it was called one night in miami okay that, like if you get that wrong you're watching just a very different movie so let me make sure <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll I'll know the the general yeah. path to look for. <laughs> okay. Yeah, one night in Miami, and I guess it is it's uh it was a play first. Interesting. A fictional account of the real night. Cassius Clay, Malcolm X, Sam Cooke, and Jim Brown, running back Jim Brown. Okay. 
and I th yeah, I thought that was really cool. Um, I'm trying to think. Yeah, I, I I love that kind of stuff of like uh, very idea driven things and people just like the long long dialogue and people engaging with ideas and things like that. Yeah, so right. And, and I, yeah, and it, it wasn't something I hadn't watched something like that for a while. You know, that was much less about narrative and more about points of view and different different points of view and how they might how they might clash or you know uh synergize and i can think of i don't know if i've watched any other good movies lately i mean we've watched a ton of stuff it's been quarantine you know so we'll go through fits um i did i read have you read infinite jest oh mike jimerson that this is like the infinite jest channel oh, oh it is oh <laughs> well, i read i read that early quarantine oh you um, did was that your first david foster wallace you read or yeah yeah uh okay. i mean it, spilled the beans we should have started here <laughs> dude <laughs> that that would have been that would have been fantastic um holy shit i didn't i didn't want to read another book after that because i didn't i what's that it ruins you oh yeah it's like i i didn't want to push it out you know of yeah. uh so and i think what i did is probably what a lot of other people did is i read the last few lines i thought to myself what the fuck did i just read and then i read the first chapter again yeah you know right away um and That's talk about life. storytelling talk, talk about how much of the major plot line happens between the rest of the book and the first chapter you know yeah. like um that it was it was hard to read it was a challenge mm -hmm. uh which i very much appreciated uh but it also read like he had a blast writing it yeah the the different points of view the characters the almost exhaustive cataloging of detail uh, -huh. uh the way so much of the story is actually told in the footnotes um i mean it was i'd never read anything like it obviously and i i can't imagine that i ever will again uh but yeah i thought it was fucking fantastic yeah that that was the book that i read my freshman year of college that just i i was never the same afterward and and right. uh, all of my all of my interest in writing and taking it seriously came from that book and, and reading David Foster Wallace. Of, right. Uh, that, what? Or go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, I feel like, you know, there's some things you experience something and you think, oh shit, we can do whatever the fuck we want, you know? Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. See, th that, that, that's exactly the thing. And, and like, he gets criticized for this a lot too, but what I love about his stuff is that every single line is just, is just so forcefully entertaining and and like he he really plays to you as a reader and makes it so that like it's it's a little bit more work than your average book but like it's, yeah. it's just so worth it and he like he really i feel like takes it seriously just reader engagement at all costs yeah like e even if it's tough even if he's getting into math and like weird heady ideas it, he's, yeah. he's just going to be like it's so for the reader i, I fucking love that man yeah uh right and that was another one of those like where are you coming up with these ideas kind of book like where is this coming from where uh like the the elevated way that the the coach talks about tennis about the i, I mean i can't even i can't even recall it but it's like you know it's the the dynamic quality between the player and the arc of the ball uh it's it's ridiculous and yeah and he'll do all these little tiny wordplay things uh like what the character tiny yule he would say uh and you will you know so there's like a contraction ll <laughs> like like you will will uh i feel like just little tiny little things like that peppered throughout of this dude this dude is having a good time writing this um and so many yeah so uh, i was left with so many images you know, like of uh, Randy Lentz putting uh, cats in trash bags until they suffocate and saying, there, 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 yeah. you know, 
uh, did fucked, fucked up stuff. That that and, passage where, sorry to cut you off, but where he, uh, Randy Lenz, I think he relapses and he gets chased after killing all of those dogs by the Brazilians. Yeah. And it like, I think culminates into Gately getting shot. Right. It's That's like right. 20 pages, but it's just one of the most evocative and like well-written pieces of fiction I've ever read. Dude, it, uh, yeah. Lens falling apart and then like his almost off-screen death, you know, at watching the film, um, his, his weird arc of just like snaking into the story and then you follow him around town a little bit and then he snakes out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. After angering like those party guys that see him kill that dog and chase it back and they're all big chested and then Gately uh, kills two of them, right? Mm -hmm. Or uh, who's or, the other guy? Think. Green, Bruce Green killed one or shot one. But yeah, he gets shot in the shoulder. Um, yeah. Dude, that, that, that is a hell of a passage. And I just have such an image of like damp city streets with the lights reflected on it and seeing uh randy's lanky tall frame just slithering in an alley you know it's oh yeah yeah uh that yeah that was fucking intense that that whole sequence and then like he ate there's some morbid detail that uh the uh the wheelchair the wheelchair assassin related about Lentz when they picked him up and they made him watch the entertainment. Uh -huh. Like he ate his buddy's finger or something. I don't know. God damn that fucking story. I don't think it was him, but don't, don't they shove a broom down somebody's throat? Too? Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. That was, that was one of the shop keeps the, okay, yeah. yeah. The two guys that have the shop. Uh, yeah. The wheelchair assassins did that. He had locked the, the one door because they had, they had a master and they didn't realize it there because it was like a repair shop or something uh -huh. or like a VCR shop or something. Ah, crazy well, shit. I, I think that book is a perfect example too, or of his style of writing is a perfect example of that contrast to George Saunders writing where the, the images that he builds are so intentionally rife for interpretation maybe in a way that George Saunders stuff eludes, even though David Foster Wallace was a fan of George Saunders. And the one I'm speaking about most specifically is like the actual narrative events, like of the entertainment of the acid burned face woman leaning over the, the bed and like telling the child who's like POV is the camera that she's so sorry for like setting up this desire system and, that it's like bigger than the both of you or something like that. Like aside from being a completely haunting image is, is just like such a meticulously well-rendered image to me that says like you get the seduction of the beautiful body, but the actual ugliness under the veil representing desire. And then it's your mother who teaches you this desire along like Oedipal lines and you as the baby are sort of internalizing it before you have any chance to opt out. And, and like, it, it's just incredible. Like, like that, that is just one of those things that fucked me up when I read that. Like, I just wow. I could not believe. And, and like you said, too, there is this sense when you read him, it's like, oh, my God, anything is allowed. Like, you can just do yeah. anything that you want. Yeah, yeah, right. Which, of course, and he makes it look easy. Well, not really, honestly, because it's, it's, it's absolutely the densest in time and narratively. It is so fucking dense. You know, all these strings of connections that tie to other things. Uh, it's such a big world with um, so many little connections. So it's not that he makes, he pulls it off somehow. So someone who is inspired comes away erroneously with the idea like, I, you know, I can make something big and beautiful and crazy and wacky. But of course, I can't imagine how the fuck he did it. You know, I can't imagine how he did that. Like yeah. where do you where do you start? Well, so I've I've read several of the books that inspired him, and and if you really like David Foster Wallace, you should ch uh, check out Thomas Pynchon. Okay. Because th I argue that they're different enough that it's not like theft, but it's really rewarding after, especially reading Infinite Jest, to read Gravity's Rainbow, 
and okay. to read other novels by Thomas Pynchon because you see just the the influence and the and the imagery they play with and the mood of of like elevated speech but then also really colloquial descriptions and and like this meshing of highbrow and lowbrow is something that Thomas Pynchon pioneered during his career and and like David Foster Wallace downplayed the influence that Pynchon had on him but if you read it it is undeniable it, it's All right. the, the thing is though too though is Pynchon's a lot less accessible so I think one of the greatest victories of David Foster Wallace is that like he he took the best aspects of Pynchon's mood and made it like so much more readable and accessible to readers interesting yeah uh gravity's rainbow i'll check that out yeah that i mean that that's another one dude like if you want one of those like or, or if you feel like you don't want to read anything else after infinite jest that's the one that'll like it's it's fucking tough like there there are because i i think he was on a bunch of drugs when he wrote it so he's quoted as saying that like some of the stuff he doesn't even know what he was going for so i, I don't want to spoil anything for you but just like kind of know that going in that like you don't need to labor over every little image. It's more of like a let it wash over you. And, but, but I think you'll get a lot out of it. If if you'd like to suggest you'll like gravity's rainbow. Right on. Yeah. I'm in. I'm in. Cool. Yeah. Well, (laughs) well, (laughs) right on. Yeah. What what Uh, do you think? I, I feel like, we're, we're almost at two hours. Like, do you just want to go for four? Do you want to yeah, let's just so then put on some coffee. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I mean, I feel like we, we've hit it to there and back. And like, I, I've already covered so much David Foster Wallace and Thomas Pynchon on this channel. If there was any anxiety that you had of not fitting into the, the purpose <laughs> of the channel, like we just definitely took care of that. So good. Great, great, great. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad. Yeah. Um, and I'm glad I'm glad to talk about that too, because I mean, when I first read it, I just wanted to talk about it with somebody, you know. I was like, can will somebody talk to me about this book? And so, you know, read read on the internet and stuff. So it's nice, nice to have just chatted that out. I'd, I'd like to read it again in the future. Um, probably not immediately, of course. Yeah. But man, it left a fucking mark, man. And not everything does that, you know. Yeah. It, it, he's he's become really controversial um because his his personal life is is he was like a creep apparently and yeah i've heard that even outside of that a lot of people think his just his whole style is kind of like it sort of eschews the basic requirements of like story construction and and like people feel like it's cloying and smarmy the really like elevated neurotic way that he writes but i've I've found it's just like it's just polarizing like you either love it or you hate it right if you love it then yeah it's like it's gonna it it just changes everything so yeah yeah i mean i just i just love it even on the grounds of like i marvel at its creation you know like you can you know you can dislike it all you want but you can't say he didn't do it you know you can't say he didn't he didn't make this fucking thing like it's, oh my god yeah well that's what pisses me off about the way some people talk about him they'll be like he he sucked at writing and it's like it, like, it's like that yeah it's like you can you can dislike hendrix but you cannot say he was not a good guitar player yeah it, it, exactly like I, I i can't expect everybody to like it but but just on a bare minimum level of like effort and and determination it's like it, it's something to marvel at yeah it fucking is dude it's a force of yeah it's a, a force of will for sure yeah <laughs> right on all righty man well yeah I'm, I'm glad we got to do this and i'm glad that you uh brought up infinite dress because i've been tired of boring my friends with it so i can blame you for its insertion in this video yeah hell yeah i'll take the credit or the blame whichever Either but way. i'm glad to have brought it up absolutely well, I guess I will wrap it up then. Um, everybody, this has been Mike Jimerson, improviser, painter, reader, father, Chicago resident. Hey, I'm not a father. Oh, you're not? No, I don't have kids. I have to all this flipping and, and you didn't stick the landing. Oh my God. I, I literally thought that I, I projected a daughter onto you. I Far thought out. I, I have a niece. Oh, maybe that was it. Maybe I saw a, a young girl on Instagram. That was that's it. very possible. That is very possible. I've posted my niece several times on there. OK, 
pit while I while I take it all back. Um, married man, husband. My <laughs> yeah, <joke. laughs> I'll take that. But anyway, I've been Daniel Backer. Um, Pringle is over here stretching his wing. But this has been Off the Wall Novels, and we have reached our conclusion. <laughs>